start. Definitely. Thank you. Um, uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome you all to yet another edition of our webinar series. And this today we have a very important and very interesting uh, topic on post-operative cognition. This topic is under a big debate because the actual mechanism underlying this brain fog following anesthesia or surgery is yet to be yet to be you know discovered. So there are so many theories about neuroinflammation, but nothing is concrete. And for an anesthesiologist, what started off as a very normal anesthesia, very unassuming, very uncomplicated anesthesia, when you find that the patient develops some personality changes or impairment in the post-operative period, I mean, it comes as a real shock to the anesthesiologist because at the, the whole process seems to be normal. And the worse would be whenever the patient develops irreversible dementia. So that would be the worst thing to see a patient develop, especially these elderly patients. So today's webinar will hover around all the reasons which, is the, which could be the potential reasons for post-operative cognitive decline and also the treatment which can be offered as of now. A very interesting uh, one and a half hours. And over to you, uh, Thank you so much, ma'am, for your words of wisdom. And uh, um, as ma'am has already summed up, uh, I extend a very hearty welcome to all my respected distinguished seniors, faculty members, colleagues, and dear residents. A very, very good evening to all. As ma'am has aptly put that uh, uh, post-operative cognitive decline is still an, uh, is an enigma to us. The mechanism is not well understood. So, uh, and it definitely carries a very significant impact in the post-operative uh, uh, recovery of a patient. And that is why, as ma'am has said, that it is pertinent to discuss all these concerns with that. So uh, without wasting much time, I would now request um, uh, Professor Sanjeev Palta uh, to kindly extend a welcome to all so that we can uh, start the webinar. This thematic webinar series, the today's topic, as we all know, is post-operative cognitive dysfunction. So over to Sanjeev Palta, sir. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, good evening, Honorable President. Uh, uh, good evening, Dr. Nanaveen, President-elect. Good evening, Dr. Nandita. Uh, uh, professor and head from ASCOM Jammu and uh, to all our respected colleagues and faculty and other members of uh, this webinar. And as ma'am has already specified about the importance of this topic and day in, day out, we people in India are now having a more of an adriatic population and uh, the kind of uh, the cognitive decline which is expected to have in this kind of a population post-operatively, very relevant topic to hear. I now uh, extend a very warm welcome to Ma'am Nandita, and I request her to please introduce the first speaker, Dr. Uh, uh, Surinder uh, Pal Singh Bedi, uh, for the first lecture of this webinar. Thank Hello. you, Ma'am. Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, like everybody is saying that it's a very interesting topic, but yet a lot of things needs to be done because nobody actually pays importance or any the relevance to this topic because all the time our patients are doing so well under anesthesia that they are not concerned about the post-operative cognitive dysfunction. It's only whenever we get a patient actually in the post-operative period who is so confused, who is delirious, who is so violent, then we realize that yes, this patient has gone in for post-operative cognitive dysfunction. It may be in the acute phase in the first 24 to 96 hours, but then it go, in certain patient, it really goes on to um, develop as a delirium and uh, even dementia. So without wasting time, I would like to introduce the speaker of the day. It is uh, Dr. Surinder Paul Singh Bedi. 
He is a senior anesthesiologist and a medical director at the Indus Group of Hospitals at Mohali. Welcome, Dr. Surinder, for your talk. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, and thank you, uh, everyone. Thank you, uh, President, ma'am. Uh, thank you, President elect, sir. And thank you, Dr. Palta, for uh, you know, facilitating this talk. Uh, it, it's, it's an honor always to uh, you know, address uh, the concerns about you know, anesthesia and anesthesia delivery uh, to our fellow uh, I mean, anesthesiologists across India. Uh, the uh, topic today uh, is, uh, I'll introduce uh, the topic. Uh, 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 the topic today, I'll introduce the topic. Dr. Richa, you are the host, you have to mute others, please. Just a minute. Okay, I'll introduce the topic and then Dr. Jugesh, uh, who is also my colleague, and uh, we've been together working together since the days in the and he will uh, then, uh, Madam Nandita had. Uh, very rightly put uh, that this is uh, an issue which is uh, yet to be you know settled there's a lot of controversy as as we don't know how anesthesia works similarly we don't know how this post operative cognitive decline happens i have specifically used uh, the word post operative cognitive decline because it's a it's a complex of many uh, you know uh, entities so it's uh, it's delirium, it's post-operative uh, cognitive dysfunction, and then it's uh, dementia. So as we go, I'll introduce the topic and uh, some important points about it. My first, uh, am I audible? Is it fine? Hello. No, no, yes, you're audible. audible. Yes. You're audible. Okay. Okay. So uh, my first exposure to. Uh, post-operative cognitive decline was there was a very gentle 64-year-old lady uh, whom I uh, gave spinal anesthesia for her vaginal hysterectomy, a very decent lady and kept on talking to me for almost one and a half hours uh, the surgery was on. Next day in the same ward when I went to do a PAC, I saw her standing on her bed and then shouting uh, the most choicest of abuses to people around. And the whole of the board, uh, board, I mean, the nurses and the doctors there were trying to calm her down. And I was astonished what has happened to her. And those were the days of uh, my, when I was doing my post-graduation. Uh, and frankly speaking, I, could, I did not know that it had something to do with surgery. So perhaps, you know, we started talking that she must, she must be, you know, uh, very, uh, she must be a pain for her daughters-in-law and this with this kind of behavior. So I, I didn't know that I was one of the persons who was contributory to this, if not the cause of it. So Dr. Bedi, uh, you have muted yourself probably. Uh, just a second, sir. Just a second. Uh, please. 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 Uh, so when I was working in sector 32, Dr. Palta must be remembering, Dr. Raj Bahadur was doing, uh, uh, he did uh, uh, total knee replacement and uh, the, we gave patient combined spinal epidural. And then next day morning he came that uh, from now on you will give uh, general anesthesia to all my patients because the patient was 
you know he he was tearing off his uh, dressing and then he was trying to stand up and he was uh, very agitated so that was probably you know post operative delirium at that point of time so those kind of situations uh, do arise with us uh, because they affect us in the immediate post operative period and they are very uh, you know situations where patient can harm himself or herself and patient can harm uh, the caregivers as well so cognition uh, what is cognition cognition is a set of mental activities uh, which we which involve acquiring and processing of the information so that we are able to uh, carry on with our day to day living it enables us to solve problems and make plans it is very similar to intelligence but it is not intelligence the difference being that intelligence pertains to the learned behavior which we acquire over time and then we use that behavior in unforeseen or complex situations so uh, so that's quite uh, i mean this is real intelligence because we all have heard of artificial intelligence where machine learning and then um, machine learning makes a, an algorithm where the algorithm then teaches them to uh, to be, uh, behave in the situations and possible so intelligence and cognition uh, we are which about which we are talking are very similar but not the same uh, so history of cognitive decline in anesthesia the first uh, uh, attention towards you know insanity following nitrous oxide administration was published in 1887 by edward and bose they described that patients getting nitrous oxide uh, showed a uh, insane behavior delirious behavior in the post operative period then in the modern world uh, the the recent world 1955 bedford he described uh, in detail about the post operative cognition uh, dis, uh, cognitive dysfunction in his uh, in lancet in 1955 he described it in the as the adverse cerebral effects of anesthesia on old people sorry to interrupt dr bethi uh, are you sharing your screen right yes now? i'm sharing my screen sir no, no, that's not visible can you please share your screen now okay again i'll do that again sir is it fine is it is it being shared now yes sir. yes sir yes. yes now it's all right okay yes make it full screen please yeah i am doing that is it fine now yes yes doctor so, so yeah so i was talking about cognition thereafter i was talking about history of cognitive decline and you know post operative changes in cognition happen uh, because of the stress of anesthesia surgery intensive care or many unknown factors uh, in the few in first 3 days it generally it's in in the form of a delirium there after after the first week it can the delirium may last up to 7 days post 7 days this delirium turns into post operative cognitive dysfunction which lasts up to 3 months mostly and after 3 months up to 1 year this can extend and thereafter it turns generally into dementia recently uh, though this uh, this definition is not very clear it's still very fluid but uh, they have resorted to terming it as neurocognitive disorder of mild or major uh, 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 major uh, severity uh, they call it post operative delirium up to 7 days within 30 days Uh, if that doesn't improve we call it delayed neurocognitive recovery and thereafter uh, till 12 months we term it as post operative neurocognitive disorder so the incidence decreases very very uh, i mean uh, drastically after the first year the post operative delirium uh, basically delirium uh, is a disorder of reduced attention and orientation to the environment it is a situation where the patient is uh, not able to carry on uh, i mean the, the usual uh, plans activities he or she is uh, sort of disoriented to the environment the hallmark is that it is very acute it appears within 24 hours uh, post uh, surgery it is fluctuating there's there are lucid intervals when patient uh, appears very normal and then uh, 
it vexes and wanes so it fluctuates it, it it is generally it as a pattern you know post operative delirium in the first 3 to 6 hours patient becomes uh, very normal and thereafter the uh, the the phenomena comes back so so delirium <clears throat> as you can see is it's it's very different from emergence agitation which which lasts as long as your anesthesia effect lasts after that emergence agitation uh, the delirium starts the delirium can start in the post anesthesia care care unit itself it can carry on into the icu or the post operative care units uh, outside the theater environment uh, there are three types of uh, uh, post operative delirium seen uh, it is hypoactive in 64% of the patients it's hyperactive in 5 to 22% of the patients and uh, in rest of the patient it's a mixed psychomotor disorder the hypoactive one the patient it is different from depression the patient generally doesn't talk much uh, it's different from depression because here the patient appears to be disoriented and there is reduced attention and there is incoherence uh, there's altered uh, memory there's uh, there's uh, change in the perception and there are behavioral behavioral changes so in hyperactive patient is very very uh, aggressive patient is uh, dangerous to himself or herself as i have already mentioned and patient is also very uh, dangerous to the caregiver the problem is that the patient tries to pull out the intravenous lines the patient uh, may pull out the cbc patient may pull out the catheters and patient may try to remove uh, the dressing or the or may interfere with his or her wounds so that's the problem we face in the post operative delirium uh the pre okay the pre, there are uh, certain predisposing factors uh, the patient factors are the male gender it happens more so in after 65 years of age though report it has been reported in the young uh, patients as well but it is more uh, uh, i mean seen in the age group of more than 65 years uh, the predisposing uh, uh, mental uh, disorders like depression delirium dementia do contribute they, those patients have very high chances of going into post operative uh, cognitive decline uh, pa patients with poor in oral intake patients who were um immobile for long time before the surgery or who were dependent on somebody for their day to day activity or those patients who had a, who had the history of falls they are more likely to un, uh, to have this post operative cognitive uh, impairment then patients who are alcoholics or who are uh, who have withdrawals or who have addicts um, before the surgery they are more likely to experience it polypharmacy where patients are polypharmacy patients generally also have a lot of comorbidities those patients who are on uh, more than three drugs pre operatively like somebody being on anti thyroids somebody being on uh, anti hypertensives or anti diabetic drugs uh, at the same time so three or more than three having polypharmacy they are more likely to you know uh, go into post operative cognitive decline narcotics are the single most important factor uh, include which includes uh, is not limited to but includes tramadol and pethidine sedatives benzodiazepines are very notorious the patients on benzodiazepines are very highly likely especially the long acting ones uh, they are very highly likely to go into post operative uh, delirium and post operative cognitive decline thereafter all the drugs anticholinergics which also includes our own uh, neostigmine and all those drugs which have remote cholinergic effects like steroids diuretics or digoxin they are also uh, more likely to you know uh, predispose your patient to post operative cognitive decline apart from that the comorbidities or the uh, uh, conditions of the patient like severe acute uh, emergencies or illnesses of any kind chronic illnesses comorbidities have already discussed uh, electrolytes disturbances electrolyte disturbances of any kind and especially hypomagnesemia they are they predispose to uh, the patient to post operative cognitive decline 
chronic renal and liver failure, pa patients who had had stroke in the last one month uh, before the surgery, patients of uh, acute severe trauma, and patients with terminal illnesses. So all these are the predisposing factor. And as you can judge from the number, the number of, you know, sheer number of the predisposing factors, it means we have not been able to pinpoint the exact cause and what actually happens. But it's a problem for us because it, it happens. Then uh, the prevalence is 5 to 15% overall. Uh, it's high in uh, hip emergency and hip surgery. It has been especially observed that post-emergency hip surgery, uh, the incidence is very high. It's, uh, it, it varies up from 4% up to 53%. In 90% of, of our patients, uh, this problem will be transient. It will settle down with time, with passage of time, even without you know, any intervention. But in the rest of 10%, the issue is that it is not benign. It, it, it is linked clearly to increased mortality, increased dependence of, of for day-to-day -day living on, on the, you know, uh, the, the caregivers, and persistence of cognitive decline can go beyond uh, one year and may turn into dementia. So, uh, so this decline, you know, it can continue. It can, it can, patient can be normal. Then he, he may she, he or she may end up in a mild mild form, or they can have a major cognitive decline. So. Uh, in generally, uh, to to uh, to diagnose post-operative delirium, uh, we can we use a confusion assessment method. Uh, it, uh, it's very easily available on the Google. It's a it's a bit detailed one, but I'll it has four. It tests the patient on four uh, domains. That is uh, the acuteness of the the event, uh, fluctuating waxes and veins. There is inattention. Patient is not able to pay attention to his or and thus not uh, patient is not able to contribute to his or her her own care. The the organized the thinking is disorganized and certainly the patient is not as alert. The patient was preoperatively. So these four domains need to be tested to confirm delirium because the differential diagnosis is varied. You know, patient can have a serious problem like uh, uh, septic encephalopathy to you know, actual delirium and then post-operative delirium. So we, we have to be very careful when this happens. Uh, now this post-operative delirium was uh, basically the delirium term, it means off the track. It was described first by Hippocrates in 400 BC, uh, the delirium per se, and uh, the Hippocrates went on to say that it is certainly the delirium of any kind you know, is linked to fatality. Uh, whereas post-operative cognitive dysfunction, it is subtler. There is inability to recognize well. There is difficulty in uh, completing simple day-to-day -day tasks like, you know, patient being able to uh, write a letter, patient being able to pick up a book and keep it where he or she intends to keep. So those, those tasks, tasks become very difficult for the patient in that a period when the patient uh, up to three months post-operatively. So uh, it's a delayed uh, neurocognitive recovery uh, if it presents in 30 days. And if it goes beyond that and persists up to one year, it is post-operative uh, neurocognitive disorder. The incidence of post-operative cognitive dysfunction, the terms post-operative delirium and post-operative cognitive dysfunction are two distinct entities. The post-operative delirium does not uh, extend beyond seven days. Whereas post-operative cognitive disorder, which is a subtler form, uh, it persists up to even one year with a peak incidence at around three months. It, it generally persists around three months. So uh, if I talk about the incidence, it's 30% at, at the one week, 10 to 13% at three months, and it uh, drastically comes down to 1% at one year in elderly non-cardiac patients. In the cardiac surgery, uh, the incidence is much higher, almost double at one year. Post-operative cognitive dysfunction, uh, there's no clear accepted definition even by uh, the diagnostic, uh, diagnostic and statistics uh, you know, management. Uh, 
um, uh, of the mental disorders definition uh, five. It is decline in the cognitive ability than the baseline, which was there in the preoperative pre period. It is across single or multiple uh, cognitive domains, which means um, the attention, the memory, uh, you know, uh, the alertness, all uh, or even one or all the domains can get affected. So patient has difficulty in writing, remembering, managing lists, and it is very tangible. It's very clear that this is happening uh, and the caregivers and the relatives who are who generally know the patient very well, they come to recognize that there is something wrong with the patient, uh, which was not there in the preoperative period. And it is also associated with increased risk of death at one year's uh, post-surgery. The diagnosis is difficult, but uh, can be assessed by abbreviated mental tests. They, these tests, I've, I will not go into too much detail because uh, you know they're all easily available on the Google and then uh, there's no, uh, and I think we can also take the psychiatric the psychiatrist help in evaluation if we feel that patient goes into these uh, problems. And I, I, I think Dr. Jogesh will also touch those uh, in, in, in a way where he talks about the management of uh, the, the disorder. The, uh, uh, this uh, MMSC, this, is, this I'll talk about a bit, and the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Tools they are also a very effective tool which has been described by the literature. So in the pre-operative period itself, uh, we can do this minimal, mini mental status examination. Yeah, the maximum score is 30. Uh, less than 24 is suggestive of uh, you know some uh, issue uh, with the patient. So this test uh, do, uh, test it 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 measures orientation, recall, attention, calculation, and language. And this is something like this, where you ask uh, the patient, what year is this? What season is this? What month is this? Just to see the orientation of the patient or uh, to see the re recall. And it is the immediate memory and the short term memory, which gets affected the most. Uh, what country we are in, what state we are in, where are you? What is this room? So, uh, so uh, OK. Uh, is there a question by somebody? OK. No. So this is uh, easily available on Google, which we can always see. And then thereafter, the patient may turn into dementia, which generally happens at one year. It's uh, according to the uh, diagnostic and statistics uh, uh, and management of mental uh, diseases. Uh, definition is that it is an insidious and progressive disorder of impaired memory and at least one cognitive domain of the following, that is language, reason orientation, task completion gets affected. It is, uh, the evidence is there that it is uh, the surgery and anesthesia. I mean, the post-operative, uh, you know, it, it there, there are definite links, but how much it is uh, and what is, uh, to what extent it is, uh, you know, uh, related to surgery and anesthesia, that is yet to be proved. So it's an umbrella term used to describe a set of symptoms where patient has problems of region, the reasoning, uh, perception, memory, thinking, judgment, uh, and so on and so forth. So the pathophysiology, nobody knows anything about it, how it happens, why it happens. No single uh, phenomena or etiology or I mean mechanism describes how it happens. But a few things are there which have been implicated that there are inflammatory uh, mechanisms involved. It's understandable that in uh, cardiac surgery, when the patient is on cardiopulmonary bypass, and you know there are the 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 there uh, occur a lot of uh, you know uh, inflammatory stimuli go go there. But this also happens in uh, non uh, cardiac surgeries. Um, there is the mechanism of neuroinflammation has also been described, whereby we say that there is some kind of uh, astrocyte or exonal injury involved. Uh, oxidative stress uh, due to the free, uh, free oxygen radicals has also been uh, described. Microemboli, which go in, you know, especially in cases of hip surgery where the incidence is very high. So microemboli also go uh, in a large number in uh, patients uh, who were on cardiopulmonary bypass. So maybe the microemboli cause, you know, uh, hypoperfusion of the parts or the small areas of the brain leading to, you know, neuronal injury and 
maybe that causes this delirium and it progresses into the post operative cognitive dysfunction or even dementia hypoperfusion uh, either because of these emboli or because of the low blood pressure itself in many of the surgeries uh, has also been implicated hyperventilation by causing hypocarbia has also been uh, you know implicated but there's no clear cut evidence of any single etiology being uh, able to do that and there there has been also a hypothesis that it's because of the disruption of uh, the blood brain barrier leading to the neuronal injury and neuroinflammation so actually nobody is clear about it and that is why it's very difficult to tackle because we don't know the cause uh, and with that uh, uh, i think i have introduced the concept and dr jogesh will take up from here thank you very much uh, i'm ready to take any questions if there are thank you dr bethi uh, uh, ma'am uh, can we have the second topic now because both of these topics are interrelated so probably we can have the questions at the end of the session dr nandita please that's perfectly fine i think that will be better thank you ma'am thank you dr richa uh, can we see you the second are you sitting with me only i'll just uh, hand over the my place to him yeah okay so uh, thank you so much uh, sir vedi for um, uh, you know an excellent talk and uh, insight into what exactly is the etiology of delirium so uh, now we move on to our next talk and before we uh, do that uh, may i have the may I request uh, dr sapna and dr uh, uh, gehlot from rohtak to kindly introduce them and introduce the speaker as well thank you ma'am dr sapna from mulana yes. ambala and dr preeti gehlot from rohtak our uh, distinguished chairperson for the talk to kindly introduce the dr yogesh thank you yeah dr preeti uh, uh, dr richa can you hear me am i audible we can hear you thank you dr sapna uh, good evening dr indrani ma'am navin sir and dear seniors and colleagues uh, thank you making me a part of this webinar next topic for today is the mitigation strategies for post operative cognition impairment as they say the prevention is the best medicine so it becomes very important to recognize the risk factors and to prevent it as early as possible so uh, which will be dealt in detail by the dr yogesh agarwal dr yogesh agarwal is a senior anesthesiologist and director critical care i welcome dr yogesh agarwal thank you ma'am for introducing me and thank you everyone for giving me this opportunity to present in this uh, august meeting uh, i am very happy to present a topic very close to my heart deal a lot of patients with uh, post operative cognitive decline and uh, as dr pedi has already made my life very easier by introducing almost everything uh, as you have already realized that uh, post operative cognitive decline is not a single entity but is a encompasses a group of clinical uh, conditions where patients present with varying degree of uh, confusion and difficulty in perception uh, in the post operative period uh, at varying time periods and uh, it mostly affects the elderly population and as you know all know that with advances in medical system the overall expectancy of life is increasing so are dealing more and more patients in elderly uh, age group who are presenting for elective as well as emergency surgeries and it is a real problem sometimes because uh, these conditions may not only increases post op uh, stay of the patient they can also contribute to major complications like pulmonary complications or wound infection they can also endanger the life of the patient as well and since uh, it is a emerging uh, problem and with increasing awareness uh, i think in coming times uh, it can be a reason for major litigations because of some of the permanent features that can persist in the patients for prolonged periods after a seemingly uh, small surgery or anesthesia so since anesthesia is uh, implicated to either precipitate or aggravate uh, these changes 
so as an astrologist we must be aware about the evidence base uh, and the diagnosis as well as management of these uh, problems sir, so your Sorry. slides are not moving i think no, no i am not, not moving it <laughs> i am just introducing myself <laughs> sorry a bit it's a bit longer so sorry uh, what i was saying that we as an astrologist must be aware about the evidence base so that we are able to effectively uh, communicate uh, it uh, the uh, the implications to the patient as well as the attendants we should be able to as uh, diagnose these problems at the earliest manage them effectively and document them properly uh, so that medical legal implications can be avoided. So as Dr. Bedi has already said that uh, these problems uh, encompasses a series or a varied group of uh, clinical symptoms and the definition is still not clear though DSM-5 has tried to define these entities into different categories, but there are still a lot of gray areas to be defined. And so we still don't know that actual definition, the incidence uh, is reported to be highly variable uh, while some studies uh, report it as low as 10% in the post operative period and some studies uh, quoted to, uh, the incidence to be as high as 60%. So we actually don't know the incidence. The etiology, as Dr. Bedi have already said, it's multivariate and there are a lot of theories, but none is conclusive. None can explain all the symptoms in all the patients. We do actually know that there are a lot of predisposing factors which predisposes this elderly population to uh, this post op cognitive decline. Uh, so I've divided them into preoperative factors and intraoperative factors. Preoperative factors, Dr. Bedi has already uh, covered. But in this thing, I would like to uh, introduce two new things. One is low education level or uh, education level lower than higher uh, high school actually it predisposes these patients for more mental decline in the post-operative period because education is supposed to expand our horizon, stimulate our brains and increase our cognitive reserve. Also in this whole gamut, a very important factor is diabetes mellitus. We, as you know, diabetes can affect almost every organ in the body. So from visual impairment to autonomic instability to gastropathy to diabetic uh, nephropathy, these, uh, uh, this disease can affect the perception of the patient uh, because of the fluctuating blood glucose level. It can cause neurotoxicity. Uh, hypoglycemia itself can cause neuronal death. So diabetic patients are actually fairly highly uh, susceptible to post-op cognitive decline. And so we should give proper uh, importance and give uh, proper time to control blood sugar in patients, uh, particularly above 65 years of age, undergoing major surgeries at least. So apart from preoperative factors, there are many intraoperative factors which can affect the incidence and outcome. And among them, duration of surgery lasting more than one and a half hours, as well as type of surgery, major surgeries like cardiac, orthopedic, including joint replacement and vascular surgeries uh, have more incidence of uh, POCD, and which makes us wonder whether anesthesia has any role in it or not at all. But it is not. Anesthesia definitely has a role in exacerbating or precipitating these illnesses. Hypothermia is an important factor because in rat models, it has been found that prolonged and sustained hypothermia can cause hyperphosphorylation of tau proteins, which is similar to that seen in Alzheimer's disease. Glycemic control, I have already said that it is very important. Uh, polypharmacy, that is use of more than three drugs in a patient which can have drug-to-drug -drug interactions can precipitate these things as well. So till now, whatever I have discussed, you can deduct that these are not a single entity, not arising from a single etiology, not affecting the single type of patient. So in no, no single medication or a single or a simple strategy can be uh, devised for dealing with these illnesses. And as has been said for almost all medical diseases, prevention is the best cure. So the prevention strategies has to start in the preoperative period, 
contribute in the intraoperative period and to be dealt more aggressively in the postoperative period to prevent all these illnesses. So I will deal uh, the prevention stages in each stages separately. So in the pre-op pre -pre prevention strategies, we must uh, talk with our uh, surgical team and we should make them aware that any patient over the age of 65 posted for any elective or emergency surgery should be referred for PSE as soon as possible. Uh, because it will give you, give us time to optimize whatever we can before the surgery. Sorry. So during the pre-op examination, we should take this opportunity to do assessment of the patient cognitively. Uh, so there are so many tests, Dr. Bedi has shown uh, MSME, which is the closest to what we actually ask the patient regularly about orientation to time, place, and person. Where are they? What have they? Uh, what their name? What is the time of the day? Where are they? What have eaten in the morning? Uh, what suffering from? Are they taking any medication? Just asking the questions to the patient directly will give you a lot of information about their cognitive status, whether they are able to hear you. There may be difficulties in uh, seeing because not able to hear properly or visual impairment decreases their perception of the environment as well as there creates a communication gap between the caregiver and the patient which is detrimental in the long run. If the patient is having uh, is taking medications then we can review them and analyze them if they can be stopped or modified according to our needs, where chronic diseases, particularly diabetes mellitus or blood pressure can be controlled, hypothyroidism drugs can be optimized. And a level of cognitive function has to be documented in the PSC file. If we find that the cognitive dysfunction is of a higher level, we should uh, refer the patient to a specialist for assessment and it should be documented in the pre-op status only because this can decline or remain same in the post-operative period, but we won't be able to know if you have not examined in the pre-op period only. So there is a new concept called prehabilitation. It's separate from rehabilitation, which occurs after the event has happened. Prehabilitation is a concept where we try to optimize a patient pre-operatively before undergoing a major surgery. It may take up to six weeks to actually uh, prepare a patient for uh, major surgery and it involves basically in improving the nutrition of the patient like supplementing some uh, extra proteins and giving them some multivitamins like thiamine to alcoholics and um, uh, giving magnesium which is very uh, commonly uh, deficient uh, mineral in the elderly population they can be uh, encouraged to do some exercises to improve their mobility. They can be uh, given incentive spirometers to improve their reserve capacity of the lungs. And physiotherapy can be done uh, by professionals to improve their uh, overall well-being. So prehabilitation can be tried whenever we have time. So uh, once we have uh, optimized the patient as much as possible in the immediate pre-op period, we should again inform them about the possible outcomes in the, after the surgery that uh, what is the amount of cognitive decline that can happen, though no one can predict it, but we can give them an idea that patient might be confused. They might not be able to uh, recognize their own relatives. They might be aggressive. They might be, not be able to communicate properly their problems and that these problems can further uh, increase our other problems like they can lead to post-operative wound infections, they can prolong the hospital stay, they can even uh, increase the chances of mortality in these patients. So this should be clearly communicated to the uh, attendants because uh, if you have not informed them anything about this and it suddenly happens to their patient in the post-operative period so they can create a lot of help for you. So uh, 
to decrease the anxiety of the patient. They can be uh, oriented to the OT area. They can be shown the post-op area, the wards or the ICUs where they are planning to keep them. So, so that they become more and more accustomed to what to expect in the post-op period. Uh, one thing is uh, we should always be able to discuss the surgical options available uh, with the surgeon because it has been shown very consistently that laparoscopic surgery or less invasive surgeries are better tolerated by elderly population because of early mobility and less complications in the post period. So anesthesia consent uh, must include the possible cognitive impairments and their contribution to post recovery, hospital stay, increased morbidity and mortality. And I think uh, many of the new centers have started uh, documenting uh, this possibility. So in the pre-op area, uh, ERAS, which is early recovery after surgery protocols that have been implemented in many of the uh, conditions, but they have been found to be consistently uh, effective uh, in this age group of patients. So uh, we can decrease the pre-op fasting duration to six hours maybe for solids, two hours maybe for liquids, so that patients remain dehydrated. There is less requirement of IV fluids because you know, uh, the normal protocol of giving normal saline as IV fluid in the intraoperative period can lead to uh, metabolic acidosis, particularly in this patient group because of declining uh, renal dysfunction. They can uh, they can contribute to dyslectrolytemia, which may even contribute, which may again precipitate uh, post-op delirium. Then we can try uh, administering oral dextrose. Uh, particularly maltodextrin in a dose of maybe 100 ml one night before surgery and in the morning of surgery, which keeps the patient hydrated, decreases the chance of hypoglycemia. Thermal prophylaxis should be considered in every patient. Uh, it can be in the form of chemical prophylaxis or in the form of um, DVT pumps or maybe a combination of both in high risk patient population because uh, perioperative PT, pulmonary thrombomalism, also is a risk factor for hypoxia, which may again precipitate uh, uh, delirium or may can mimic the similar symptoms. So we should avoid uh, pre-medications, which are particularly benzodiazepines, as Dr. Bedi have already said, they are highly uh, culprit drugs for inducing post of delirium. So uh, once pre-op part is over, now we are into the intra-op uh, phase where the patient is on the table. So choice of anesthesia, if you say uh, it's a myth that general anesthesia is supposed to cause more delirium compared to regional anesthesia, but recent studies uh, refuted this myth and they say that there is no difference in outcome as far as post-op delirium and cognitive decline is required, uh, concerned between general anesthesia, regional sedation, or even LA. So uh, one can wonder whether surgery itself enough to cause post op delirium because of inflammation or the stress response or the pain of surgery can itself precipitate uh, post op delirium. But however, uh, the drugs used in GA or regional can contribute or aggravate these symptoms. So, balanced anesthesia, whatever it is, with adequate depth and adequate analgesia is the best choice. No difference in outcome between inhalational versus TIVA. However, in inhalational anesthesia, uh, sevoflurin and desflurin has shown to be somewhat beneficial compared to other inhalational anesthetics. Nitrous oxide, it's a consensus that should, that should be avoided. In TIVA, also propofol, uh, dexmedotomidine, and ketamine has shown to be some promise in preventing post op delirium. Uh, anesthesia should be titrated in a way that we should avoid using opioids, particularly long-acting opioids. Opioid sparing anesthesia can be easily attained with uh, epidural analgesia or, or maybe tap blocks or other nerve, nerve blocks or use, or use of uh, non steroid anti-inflammatory drugs. So opioids should be used to a minimum and if it is actually at all required, we can go for shorter acting opioids, uh, obviously for to, to prevent post-op uh, delirium. So intraop monitoring, though standard monitoring is required in every patient. So it is particularly important that we should measure oxygenation and ETCO2 because hypoxia as well as hypercapnia is detrimental rhythm. Uh, most of the elderly population in, in the higher age group usually have uh, rhythm disturbances, particularly atrial fibrillation, which increases the chances of thrombomolism and 
post of delirium. Blood pressure monitoring is important, but there is no difference in uh, monitoring whether it was done invasively or non-invasively. There's an interesting study that was done in uh, cardiopulmonary bypass patients, where two uh, group of patients were subjected to two different type of pressure uh, management intraoperatively. One was the lower blood pressure group, where the BP was maintained between 40 to 60, and the higher blood pressure group, where the BP was maintained between 80 to 100. So uh, the regional cerebral blood flow changes well detected by NIS in the intraoperative period. However, the outcome as regards to post of delirium incidence was no different in both the groups. So uh, we may be tempted to say that BP is not important, but uh, it's not. Uh, we should, but the consensus is that we should keep the patient where they are alive. We should keep the, we should measure the pre-induction blood pressure and try to keep the patient within 20-25% of the baseline. Blood glucose monitoring is very important because both hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia are detrimental. However, uh, maintaining a very blood, strict blood sugar monitoring uh, control, like between 80 to 100, has shown to increase the incidence of post delirium probably because of uh, incidental hypoglycemia. So a uh, regional blood sugar monitoring uh, with the control of between 100 to 150 is uh, mandated. It is highly effective uh, in uh, particular surgeries like cardiac and uh, neuroanesthesia, but in other surgeries, uh, maintaining a blood sugar around 150 with uh, prevention of hypo or hypoglycemia is enough. Temperature monitoring is important, particularly in surgeries lasting more than one hour. And neuromonitoring, though, is recommended, but uh, not available very freely. However, uh, the depth of anesthesia monitoring with bispectral index and titrating the depth to maintain a B score of 40 to 60, which is actually recommended for GA, has shown to decrease post of delirium as well as cognitive decline. But uh, the study was very small, so we need more data. NIS, that is near infrared spectroscopy, basically measures the regional cerebral oxygen consumption and gives a measure of regional blood flow. Though uh, it's non-invasive and quite effective, but uh, more study and data is required whether it is actually beneficial for the long run. Transcranial Doppler ultrasound uh, non-invasively can measure microemboli, which is very important in cardiac surgery and hip or knee effectiveness or data still is awaited. So in the intraoperative period, there are certain medications which are highly implicated uh, for delirium and that should be avoided like anticholinergics, uh, benzodiazepines, first generation antihistamines because of their prolonged duration of um, sedation as well as anticholinergic properties. Mepridin that is pesetin has, has anticholinergic properties. Metoclopramide may can induce APS, extrapyridine symptoms and can confuse us with post of delirium. Uh, because of the many theories that has been proposed, uh, like neuroinflammation or oxidative stress, um, that are the, uh, as a reason for the post of delirium, many medicines has been tried to decrease this inflammation or oxidative stress with mixed results. Uh, there are small studies, uh, but we should know that they, can, they have been tried in different populations like COX-2 inhibitors, minocycline, statins, N-acetylcysteine, amantadine, even local anesthetics. Melatonin is a drug which actually it keeps the patient uh, the circadian rhythm and uh, theoretically it should be very effective in preventing delirium, but in practical uh, drugs, three drugs that has shown what, um, promise in preventing uh, post of delirium, one milligram per kg given when it's a single bolus incidence. Dexmedetomidine, which is an alpha 2 blocker. Uh, and which provides an blocker and has shown to uh, give the operative period and uh, get 
vitamin towards delirium, but given in a single dose bolus of 0.5 milligram per kg at the time of induction of anesthesia, few studies have shown good results in the post-operative period, but all these drugs... Yes. still are being studied in all patients. Call and over here. Call and over here. Can you hear me? Uh, the connection is lost. Hello? Hello? Dr. Jugesh. Dr. Jugesh. Can you listen us, please? Uh, we'll call Dr. Dr. Jugesh. I think there's some technical error. Can you help me, please? Uh, sir, no. you are. Uh, hello? Uh, Dr. Jugesh? No. Yes, ma'am. Sir, uh, you were not audible. I think there was some. स्ट्रेटेजीज But your connection is uh, sir very erratic. Should we go back? Sir, your connection is very erratic, sir. Sudden shift. No, no, no. That no, no, no. The next slide, sir. We yes, cover sir. the next, the next slide, sir. Yes, yes this sir. slide. This Started slide. Started from here, but but, but here we are like uh, the connection is erratic, so we may start from this slide again. Sir. Hey, total, how much? Hello. Ten to fifteen minutes. आप वो कर लेना फोर हेलो डॉक्टर योगेश डॉक्टर जोगेश लेट मी कॉल डॉक्टर बेदी ऑन फोन प्लीज डॉक्टर जोगेश आई थिंक देर इज सम टेक्निकल स्नैग और सम आई थिंक प्रॉब्लम विद दी आई मीन द नेट सर्विसेज Can you hear me now? Sir, I we can hear you, yeah, can but you uh, the connection is pretty no. erratic. Doctor Richa, I think you'll have to take his slides and then let him switch off his video and then he can present. Probably his connection is weak. Uh, I'll just try that, ma'am. Dr. Jugesh, can you start sharing your slide screen again? Better. Kindly share your screen again, please. Yeah, I am starting now. Yeah, can you see it now? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Thank so, you. So, thank you, ma'am. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, so I was talking about intraoperative prevention strategies, and so it can be summarized in the form of like you should maintain an adequate depth of anesthesia. You can monitor with this if required, and we should always ensure adequate analgesia. We should uh, try to avoid opioids and try to use other modes of analgesia, including anesthetics and uh, blocks. We should maintain uh, oxygenation. we should try to continue the particular medication the patient has taken uh, previously and we should always try to avoid high risk medications particularly anticholinergics as well as uh, uh, other medications which has been, which have been implicated so in the post op care strategies uh, our usual response to getting a surgery done for a high risk patient is to send the patient to icu for better care but uh, i see psychosis is a known thing and it can uh, combine with post op delirium so uh, it's a better to issue that we should avoid uh, for sending these patients routinely to intensive care 
uh, unless it's very uh, mandatory. So we should try to keep them uh, in a quiet environment uh, to be usually surrounded by the relatives who can, who can uh, continue to uh, talk with them and keep them oriented, keep them entertained. They, the uh, patients should always be uh, kept oriented to time and place. We can place a wall clock in their room so that they can uh, know the time. There is, a, is a, if, if possible, there should be a view of the outdoors so that they can know if it's day or night. And uh, we should always uh, ensure that analgesia has been uh, continued in the post op period and probably with epidural or blocks or NSAIDs and opiates should be avoided if at all possible. In the post op care, we should always try uh, that the patients should be mobilized as early as possible. We can avoid unnecessary drains or catheters or in the NG tube in the intraoperative period so that uh, patients have a more sense of control when they are mobile. Uh, oral intake should be started as early as possible to decrease the requirement of IV fluids. Uh, breathing exercise is in the form of therapy or other um, physical or mental stimulation measures should be started as early as possible in the post-operative period of, and should be continued for a prolonged period. Uh, till the patients are ready for discharge. But sugar monitoring, uh, all elderly patients undergoing any type of surgery, even if it is a small surgery. So in the post-op uh, appearance of any symptoms of delirium, that delirium doesn't uh, necessarily mean that the patient will be uh, hyperactive or they will be abusive all the time. They can be drowsy or be unresponsive. They can be mute, which is a, a feature of hypoactive delirium. Or they can be features of mixed delirium because, uh, which, as you know, the delirium is a waxing and waning, uh, waxing and waning uh, sort of symptomatology. So uh, we should be able to detect delirium as soon as possible and. While detecting or diagnosing delirium, we should be very, very careful because many of the major organic causes can mimic these symptoms like a perioperative stroke, uh, even dyslectolytremia like hyponatremia or hypomagnesemia. Importantly, sepsis can present as aberration of mental health and withdrawal of um, many uh, drugs or as well as uh, alcohol or tobacco chewing can precipitate and uh, mimic the signs and symptoms of delirium. We must know that delirium uh, is a diagnosis of extrusion. So in the post op period, we should be very vigilant. And if in any sign of delirium occurs, we should always rule out other major organic causes uh, before uh, terming the patient as delirious. And we should involve the specialist as as uh, soon as possible, as early as possible, as frequently as possible. They should be uh, kept in the loop because dealing with uh, delirium itself is not very easy. So many of the drugs that are usually used for treating delirium in the post periods are antipsychotics like haloperidol or olanzapine. Haloperidol is available both as tablet form as well as in IV form and usually very frequently used. However, it should be very it can cause QT prolongation, and so patients with uh, previous blocks or cardiac surgery, uh, we should be very careful and uh, subject this patient for the continuous ECG monitoring. Dexamethasone or clonidine has been used very effectively to treat delirium in the post-operative period. Gabapentin, available as tablets given at night, uh, mimics GABA-like action and gives them better sleep so that they are more fresh in the daytime and the diurnal. Uh, rhythm is maintained. Magnesium has been used very effectively uh, in IV boluses intermittently, uh, provided the kidney functions are fine. And it can induce some sedation as well as because of membrane stabilization property, it can uh, decrease agitation. So once uh, a patient has developed delirium, or even if they have not developed delirium, uh, 
elderly population which have, who have undergone uh, surgery under you they should be uh, followed up regularly for new development of any post operative decline uh, as an anesthesiologist we usually uh, cannot uh, usually follow up these patients in a regular basis so they should be advised or the surgical team should be advised that these patients should be regularly followed by follow up followed up by a specialist or maybe psychologist or psychiatrist uh, end of the first week after one month three months after six months of surgery and then yearly because uh, these symptoms or the uh, decline can happen over a period of time so in a summary <clears throat> we should recognize at least patient at the earliest we should try to optimize them preoperatively we should optimize our anesthesia according to the patient's need we should optimize the post op care recognize early signs of delirium treat symptoms as early as possible and should be and should follow up these patients in a regular interval so the take home advice is prevention prevention and prevention that's the uh, way forward and with that i conclude my presentation thank you so much for patient listening and sorry for the interruption that happened in and me and dr bedi are both here so we'll be ready to take your option any questions uh i cannot see any questions in the chat box uh, thank so, you very much dr jogesh and before that uh... yes go ahead i think someone had raised her hand disha uh... from dr bedi wanted to ask something anyone please who wants to ask something well dr bedi uh, i have one question uh, we have discussed the problem of this post operative cognitive dysfunction but uh, now the time is coming when uh, we are going towards the day care surgeries and uh, this is one thing and second thing is that uh, it is uh, i mean a known fact that most of the time uh, as anesthesiologist though we say that the post op operative care also falls to some kind of an uh, in the domain of the anesthetist also but rarely it is uh, possible for an anesthetist to have that kind of a post operative visit to the patients so what do you think that uh, with respect to the day care surgeries how big this problem is there and uh, whether i mean there can be any mitigation strategies uh, for the post operative uh, cognitive delirium uh, ablation so that uh, or or the at least the knowledge uh, for the anesthesiologist to know that uh, these problems are also very common in day care surgeries dr bedi please uh so as we just discussed there is no uh, very concrete and clear cut strategy but yes if it does happen every 4 hourly up to 2 mg intravenous hello uh, so you are not audible baby uh, sir uh, 2 mg 4 hourly or say demand that that's a effective strategy in patients who are uh, i mean day care patients who have to go home so they can continue to take that medicine even uh, uh, that by 0.25 mg tablet Uh, serines which is common name for or uh, heliparidol uh, it's easily available uh, uh, like i have already discussed iras protocol uh, can i come in hello can you hear us sir no 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 sir i mean nandita has a question please yeah basically i just wanted to ask dr uh, agarwal a few things like uh, he's uh, mentioned dexamethasone and dexmedetomidine whether these yes, have to be sense. given pro prophylactically or those have to be given only once a post operative cognitive dysfunction occurs mm. and someone was talking about the cox2 inhibitors as well so because there was uh, i mean when i went through the literature there is a lot of, about, about neuroinflammation so when you talk of neuroinflammation then how do you prevent neuroinflammation if that is one of the mechanisms of post operative cognitive dysfunction can you yeah uh, ma'am actually uh, uh, i deal with a lot of cardiac patients uh, we do around 30 to 35 cases of cardiac anesthesia every month 
and you know the cardiac surgery is one of the very high risk factors for uh, post op delirium and uh, uh, if i go by my experience or the literature in the literature they said dexamethasone given in a low dose like 0.1 mg per kg at the time of induction can significantly reduce post op delirium however it should not be uh, continued for longer period of time because as dr bedi already said that stewards themselves can induce uh, cognitive uh, decline so uh, i am routinely using dexamethasone in connection lower doses uh, so that it doesn't interfere with uh, glucose uh, the side effects and i don't know whether it's helping or not but dexamethasone i'm using regularly dexamethasone uh, i'm using only for patients who have shown symptoms who are agitated or aggravated in the post op period so for treatment part i am using dexamethasone and uh, cox2 inhibitors uh, i have tried but i don't think the evidence is strong enough for their routine use uh, i will i have not even used ketamine but i have used uh, magnesium uh, actually magnesium uh i think your connection is quite erratic actually yeah uh, may i ask a question please i think they are not online actually uh ma'am i've sent a message that they have, we have lost a connection I, i i agree with dr nandita that there is no absolute evidence to the fact that whether it is cox2 inhibitors or dexamethasone which will prevent these type of patients cognitive dysfunction problems these are whatever have been shown whatever literature says whatever evidence is there they have many like you know it does not they we have to because what is the overall incidence of cognitive dysfunction it is 1 to 2% you must select only the high risk patients who are supposed to get this and then analyze and then treatment and then compare it as of now to the best of my knowledge i don't feel that there is any evidence whatever there are very slight evidence is in favor of so they cannot be done as a rule that you give all 100% of the patients you give dexamethasone or dexamethadine or cox2 inhibitors no not at all to the best of my Mm, understanding thank you ah uh, may i ask a question okay yes ma'am dr preeti yes ma'am yeah good evening everyone first of all i'm really thankful to all the organizers for inviting me here as a chairperson today i am professor at pgms rohtak and i congratulate the speakers for their very lucid presentation though the network was an issue but the still it was very nice and i have a question here so uh, does emergence from anesthesia has any correlation with the uh, i mean the delayed emergence like many patients we see that uh, in spite of you know the regular technique that we are using for almost all the patients there is a delay in emergence from anesthesia so are these patients more at risk of cognitive dysfunction post operatively or there is no such correlation to whom Who, who have you put this question, no, madam? I think we have to answer this question. <laughs> I put it to the speakers, both of them. I mean, any of them, whoever is getting an answer. But I think, Bedi sir, Bedi sir. Yes, ma'am. Sir, uh, would you please like to? There's no the such correlation, ma'am. That's I think there was some, uh, I mean, sound problem. But I think you can hear us now. Oh, yeah, we. I can is hear you. Fine? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. i think um, uh, one line which i want to add is that uh, using haloperidol as such is uh, fraught with dangers also because of the, this increase in the qt interval and all those kind of things and uh, i especially feel that in the kind of scenario where you get over here if the patient is into post operative cognitive dysfunction it is better to have a proper consultation with the concerned physician Uh, rather than i mean giving the medicine on our own for which probably as anesthesiologist we are not entitled to give so that is what i feel and uh, there is one question uh, uh, and uh, from dr chashri excuse me excuse me, excuse me, me dr paul 
जी सर वाई आर वाई आर वी नॉट एन टाइटल टू ट्रीट सच पेशेंट नो सर आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट वन ड्रग ओनली आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट हेलो पेरिडोल सर आई एम सिंग यू सी दीज आर दीज आर द ड्रग्स विच हैव मोर इन इफ यू यूज दीज टाइप ऑफ ड्रग्स दे हैव मोर इंसिडेंस ऑफ डेवलपिंग post operative cognitive dysfunction so there is a you have to find the you have to identify the patients who are at higher risk for them we have to be careful sir i feel that haloperidol he is telling that haloperidol should not be used in should the not be used should not be used should not be dangerous it is dangerous it is dangerous. not be was dangerous arrhythmias yeah yes <laughs> and uh, personally i have had a very bad experience of post operative cognitive dysfunction it was my own father who was who underwent a intertrochanteric fracture uh, surgery and then immediately uh, post operatively it was done under general anesthesia because we could not give spinal because of various reasons and then afterwards immediate post op period he had severe post operative cognitive dysfunction he was very delirious and very confused in for at least a week or 10 days but till now he is now go, gone into dementia and the dementia is progressive so when you say it is and up to one year it doesn't happen it started then he was absolutely normal and we didn't know that he would end up like that so he was not i mean uh, he he was not having any comorbidities except that ca prostate which was he was being treated for and nothing else he was not diabetic no other medications he was on still he had a intertrochanteric fracture and after that he had all this and uh, it's been almost 8 uh, years and um, the dementia is progressive ma'am this is the most important reason why this is this topic is very important because i also know of a family my own colleague uh, whose mother was in her uh, late 60s underwent surgery very un, uh, uncomplicated surgery ended up with post operative cognitive dysfunction she was a, such an active lady who would take care of the house cook clean do everything and my friend uh, uh, she could go anywhere take care of academics work in the hospital non stop she could do everything because the home home front was completely taken care of now after the surgery not only her 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 sister in law all of them take turns to take care of her i mean the whole family yes, is completely is. toppled yes so that is the, that is the most intense uh, you know the sad thing about the cognitive dysfunction i'm sure you also must have faced yeah yeah the I same mean, thing for a person who is so active you find the entire family is now hovering around him you and know it is not you cannot predict which patient is going to go in for that You exactly so i think the answer to everything at the moment as the speakers have already said so, see there is few things which are beyond our uh, uh, whatever we can do and of course we also know we can identify few high risk like cardiac surgery and all those uh, cases but uh, eras protocol should be followed without uh you know anything and and more insisting on prehabilitation which the speaker explained very well i think the nutrition the exercise the mental uh you know preparation everything is important in a patient who is susceptible i think that could help a lot i think that is very quite an important part of you know prevention uh in these patients and um, and what i would also uh, say is supposing in your post operative round you find a patient who now who has suddenly developed a brain fog and very confused how are you going to uh, this is to one of the speakers any of the any of the speakers how are you going to speak to the relative how are you going to explain the real practical problem the real practical problem yes sir in such cases the real practical problem yes sir how can we explain it as i yes. told you here is a patient who was so active 
and suddenly becomes like this it becomes very difficult to explain uh, it is frustrating for the understand yes sir dr bedi are you there bedi sir Doctor, Actually, Bedi, yeah, we deal with a lot of patients like. Uh, Bedi sir, Jogesh sir. Yes. Yes, ma'am. The yes, question is for you, sir. I, I, I think we have a, we have them answering the question. Can you hear me? Because especially following the day's surgery. Doctor, Bedi did touch it. Doctor Bedi can throw some light upon it. He has touched the topic very nicely. Yes. All these aspects. So just a minute. Yeah. Okay. I think again there is a Some connectivity, yes. connectivity issue. issue. Connectivity issues. Yeah, sir, you uh, can sir, you hear? can answer if you want. Yeah, uh, actually, I'm with a lot of patients like this, uh, so I have made a, a habit of talking with the patient as well as the attendants regularly about the about these possibilities about. This cognitive dysfunction happening postoperatively, though as Sir has said, the incidence is quite variable uh, from place to place, from surgery to surgery to patient to patient. But still, the incidence is quite uh, significant because if it affects even one patient out of hundred, uh, this uh, problem can prolong your post-op recovery as well as threaten the life of the patient. So, as a matter of fact, I uh, try to communicate with the attendants, with the patient. Every one of them that this is the possibility that this can happen to your patient, and it might not be related to the surgery directly, it might not be related to anesthesia directly, but but to the process as a whole, and that uh, this type of patient has to be kept in the ICU for proper care. Uh, this problem, and we'll try to involve you as early as possible in the post-op period for the care of the patient as well as communication, but. Nothing is guaranteed that this will will be able to prevent it. If it happens, we'll deal with it. And when it happens, uh, I just uh, get them and tell them that look, we have discussed that this can be a possibility, and this has happened. But you can see that similar type of patients are in connection. Lying near. Your uh, patient has gotten it. So it doesn't mean that the anesthesia or the surgery is done wrong. Uh, sir, we yeah, had I only last time we uh, we had a uh, we had this webinar on how to break a bad bad news. So I think we should follow the entire all the protocols of how we yes. should break a bad news. We should, should take be, the relative to a very quiet place, make them sit, offer a cup of coffee, or have a offer at least water, and then explain the whole thing, and then. Probably, you know, the, uh, so that's the communication should be very, very good in these uh, patients. And also, sir, for cardiac surgery, yes, especially, what I feel yes, is yes, we don't yes, have yes, a, yes, pulsatile, yes, yes, that we don't have a, a pulsatile bypass. So we have a non-pulsatile bypass, which means we have normothermia and a higher mean arterial pressure. I suppose that could uh, kind of, you know, mitigate... Uh, some amount of post-operative cognitive dysfunction. Don't you think so? Because use of, you know, if the patient goes on inotropic support, vasopressors, there is again more chances of, uh, you know, post-operative cognitive dysfunction in these patients. Uh, absolutely, ma'am. Very well said. And uh, there is a question in the chat box also. So if I may please um, read it for everyone. Uh, uh, question? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, I'd like to answer that question. The, Dr. Chasham Jyot, I don't think so. That's There's a no question. There's data to support that uh, a steep Trendelberg position for uh, any surgery can lead to, per se, you know, post op glavium or post operative cognitive decline. Uh, there's no such data to support this. And I don't think so. There should be a mechanism which describes it in any way uh, out of the you know, etiologies we know. Yeah. Except that there can be some passive venous congestion of the brain or... I don't know. I mean, that's just a guess. Yeah. Uh, sir, I have a question, please. 
Uh, so uh, throughout this, we have been discussing uh, discussing the etiology and how to manage it. Uh, actually, when we you know actually see the post-operative delirium, the most uh, important thing is how to diagnose it. So uh, way back, we conducted a workshop uh, on how to you know go about post-operative delirium and what are the various scales. At least what anesthesia residents can use in the post-operative period. What all the questions can be asked for? So do you think that there is a place for uh, holding more such workshops so that are uh, the residents, especially the ground force, is able to pick up the post-operative delirium at an early stage, and maybe you know uh, that may help in the early recognition, early treatment, early intervention, and probably better recovery. Uh, Ma'am, uh, very well said. I think I support that. I'll just tell you an experience which we had around ten days back. There is a patient of uh, uh, the the recipient of the renal transplant. The patient uh, uh, got shifted to the ward after 24 hours stay in the, oh, I mean, uh, the HDU or uh, the ICU. And in the ward, patient was stable for two days. On the third day, you know, patient got uh, disoriented, was uh, less attentive, and uh, uh, the uh, the ne nephrologist thought it is uh, 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 because of sepsis. Uh, they they continue to work up for sepsis, but the patient deteriorated so much that patient ha went back on the ventilator so that <coughs> ultimately <coughs> we found out uh, when we involved the psychiatrist that it is a delirium and post-operative cognitive dysfunction normally we discharge our patient on fifth day i mean the recipient but this patient is still in the hospital as we talk i mean today i think he must have got discharged uh, dr jugesh was taking care of that patient he can tell you about that patient be better. Uh, this uh, this emphasizes that it's very imperative that we are able to you know differentiate the diagnosis of the patient whosoever is disoriented because the first symptom of sepsis uh, in an elderly population will be disorientation and yes, so sir. will be in the post-operative delirium as well. And as it is sir, I think the hyperactive delirium is pretty picked up by everyone. <laughs> In yes. the you know post operative, it is the hypoactive or the mixed type which is type. difficult, yes. and we actually need tools to you know detect them early and uh, you know intervene so that it is it doesn't progress to a later stage. Yes, certainly, that's true. So, Very true. Um, any other questions? Any other inputs by our for the seniors, our colleagues? Any other? Anyone who ends, uh, wants to add something to it? So, uh, so may I present the vote of thanks, sir? First of all, thank you, chairpersons, all the seniors, mentors, for such a delightful academic discussion on both the topics. And I'm sure our residents, colleagues, and even myself have gained immensely from the academic pearls as shared by you. And uh, uh, so we had this excellent platform of knowledge sharing uh, on such an uh, enigmatic topic that was post-operative delirium. It gave me an immense pleasure to extend a vote of thanks to everyone. So first and foremost, my heartfelt thanks uh, to our worthy president, uh, Ma'am Indrani, who is so dynamic in her approach in all the thematic webinar series. Uh, Ma'am, we uh, always look upon to learn from you. And, uh, and uh, though Vishal, sir, was unable to join us today, but he's always, always available round the clock for all the academic and the technical support, which at least a non-technical person like me <laughs> doesn't know much. Uh, thank you, Tejpal, sir, as always, for joining and blessing us and sharing your valuable pearls, enriching our knowledge. And no words are any day enough to thank Naveen sir for his willingness, for his dedication toward all the academic ventures and giving us constructive inputs and making us learn the finer nuances. Um, I am deeply indebted to my esteemed and distinguished chairpersons, Dr. Palta, Ma'am Nandita, Dr. Sapna, and Dr. Gehlot, who uh, gave us critical inputs on the pertinent talks that were delivered today. It was a sheer pleasure interacting and learning from you all at this platform. Uh, thank you, Bedi sir and Jugesh sir, for adorning the opinions and the talks so, so very well and making it so lucid. I would fail if I do not acknowledge the presence of 
my all the seniors, mentors, colleagues, friends, and dear residents who have spared your valuable time uh, to join us for this webinar. And last but not the least, um, a big thank you, Pupalta sir, for always encouraging and you know being dynamic for organizing such events thank you nandita ma'am for joining thank you namin sir there's so many seniors i may be missing upon the names but thank you everyone for having given critical inputs and made this webinar so 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 interesting thank you thank you and i hope we are not encroaching the dinner time today so no no <laughs> not at all just at the time uh, sir, Dr. Dr. Tejkal, sir, will be very happy because yeah. today attendance was yeah. also very yeah. good and, you know, Absolutely. I could see the happiness Absolutely. in his face. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I, Long excellent. I think the speakers were excellent. Our chairpersons have contributed so much and uh, the, the deliberation was very, very, very positive and uh, fantastic webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so yes. much for the encouraging Long words, ma'am. Long live RSA. Long live RSA. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Long live RSA. Long live RSA. Thank you. Good night. Dr. Good Bedi, night. bye. Dr. Bedi, Bedi sir. excellent. Thank you, sir. Good night, sir. Good night, ma'am. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you so much again. Thank Good you so much night. once again for Thank joining you. us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you.